Hi, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to episode 14 of my KSP campaign. I'm time warping with Maps App 1 here until I get a connection. Noticing this new green cone showing me the mapping that it's doing. That's coming from the ScanSat mod. That's an addition since the latest update. That's pretty sweet. Uh, and the reason why I'm out here is because I have been forgetting to collect the science that this thing has been collecting. Yes, as it's mapping, it's also collecting science. So we'll transmit that, 27 science. I mean, yeah, it's out there. Might as well go get it. And then it's time to time warp out to uh, get ComSat 2 completed so that we can launch that. And while I'm time warping, I'm continuing to keep an eye on Muna 1. Uh, if you recall, it missed the moon a few episodes ago, and I'm hoping to get another moon encounter. But as I'm time warping, I'm noticing that uh, I'm not generating any electricity. And so, oh, well, that's not so good. But what I'll do is I'll time warp to the point where uh, we get our connection back, and then I can check on the satellite and see if uh, what's going on with this. But it's when I get to the point where I should be getting a connection that I realize, uh-oh, the reason why I'm not getting a connection is because my probe is dead. It is run out of electricity, so let's check this out. Now I can see here that the solar panels are edge on to the sun, so that's the problem. It's not generating anything, but I do have this backup battery. So I'm going to right click on it, turn it on, and that gives me a little bit of emergency power that I can now use to move the probe around and get the solar panels generating again. Excellent. So, uh, again, great piece of advice that uh, I'm trying to remember to keep following is to always take one of those little batteries, turn it off to give you some emergency power, and that helped me out right there. I do want to remind people I am playing with a variant of remote tech called Remote Tech XF in the regular remote tech. I wouldn't have been able to do that. In the regular remote tech, if I had lost the communication, I can't do anything whatsoever, including turning on a battery. But I do like this ability uh, of Remote Tech XF to, I don't know, do things like put your probe into a power saver mode. So we'll turn that battery off again. So if that happens again, well, I'll be able to uh, do something about it. Anyway. After time warping, I uh, didn't get that moon encounter, so we just time warped straight to ComSat 2, and uh, time to launch this guy. Now, ComSat 2 is an identical rocket to ComSat 1, which was launched yesterday, and you might recall, just didn't have enough fuel to get itself out to the orbit that I wanted. So you might be thinking, oh, this is going to have the same problem, but no, because now I have ComSat 1 out there acting as a relay. And I'm going to take advantage of it. So I'm going to time warp to the point where ComSat 1 is just a little bit behind my launch site. And this will allow me to launch ComSat 2 in a more normal uh, ascent trajectory, in a more efficient ascent trajectory, not the steep ascent trajectories that you've been seeing me do lately. And just to remind people, I consider a standard ascent trajectory pitching over right away, pretty much right after launch, and then slowly turning over. I like to use a benchmark of hitting about 45 degrees at 10 kilometers, so you can see that uh, I'm a little bit steeper than normal here. Oh, starting to get some new mock effects. These are come, these came in with 1.0, I don't know if it's 1.03 or 1.04, but they look pretty cool as our, as our vessel starts to go get into those hypersonic speeds. Oh, and those mock effects are turning into heating effects. <laughs> Actually, this gets pretty ridiculous. Uh, I am not going too fast. I want to remind you, this looks really bad. It looks like I'm doing damage to the rocket, but I do have the temperature gauges on, and you can see that none of those temperature gauges are beginning to highlight. I'm doing fine. In fact, I could be pitching even lower here without really any issues whatsoever. So if you're getting freaked out by these new heating effects, uh, don't be. It, they're just for show, and in fact, I think they're a little much. I hope Squad dials them down. But anyway, we're going to push our apoapsis way past low curve and orbit. We're going to keep shooting it up, aiming for our eventual altitude of 1,067.5 kilometers. You'll be noticing actually over there on the left that I have a new window opened up from Kerbal Engineer. This is giving me some rendezvous data. Uh, and I have ComSat 1 selected as the target. And the only thing actually I'm really looking at is the distance one. Uh, I need to keep that distance below 
2,500 kilometers because if it gets above that, then uh, ComSat 1 will be outside of communication range with ComSat 2, and I don't want that to happen. Uh, I'll talk about the other bits of information there in a little bit. All the information that I select are all stuff that I consider to be useful in certain circumstances. I try to think of all the useful information I might want and have it all there so that I don't have to continually open and close windows. So and I'll talk about that other information there when we get into doing some rendezvous. But anyway, we've got pretty close to our desired apoapsis, so now it's just a, um, a matter of getting up there and doing our circularization. And that circularization went without a hitch. Remember, what I'm really aiming for is to get a period of as close as I can to two hours. Um, so we're just thrusting up here, getting very, very close. So what I'll do is I will tweak down this engine for the last couple of puffs just to get that, um, just to, to control my thrust and get this right at exactly two hours. Well, not really exactly. I mean, Kerbal Engineer has the period down to the millisecond. That's a little bit ridiculous, but getting it down to the nearest tenth of a second will uh, more than suffice. And there we go. And we're up here with still 810 meters per second left in this vehicle. And I am honestly really perplexed by that. I mean, I knew my ascent would be more efficient than it was with ComSat 1, but not that much more efficient. That's a bit crazy. In fact, um, I worked it out. This whole insertion only cost me 3,978 meters per second. And I, I, I don't understand that. I mean, it should be 785 meters per second just to do a Hohmann transfer from low curb in orbit out to here. Uh, that means my ascent was only about 3,200 meters per second. That, that just feels wrong. So I'm honestly really, really perplexed by that. And if uh, somebody out there has an explanation on how I got out here so cheaply, please let me know because I'd love to do it again. And just like before, we'll take the two dish antennas and point one at the moon and one at Minmus. But there's one thing I do want to show you here and how these communication cones work. So if I push the button here, these are the communication cones that are going out towards um, those two bodies. When you point at a body, a celestial body of some kind, what you get are these cones of communication rather than direct lines of communication. And anything that's in those cones will be able to communicate with each other provided they have the appropriate antennas. The other thing to note while we're out here is that ComSat 1 and ComSat 2 are in no way uh, appropriately positioned relative to one another. Remember, eventually I want these satellites to each be 90 degrees apart from each other. And uh, I didn't worry about that because, remember, ComSat 1 ran out of fuel and never did get to its appropriate orbit. So their orbital periods are different. So there's no sense lining them up now because they won't stay that way. Uh, I will have to fix all this stuff later down the road. But for now, we're done with ComSat 2. It's time to... Uh, move on out to Muna 1 again and do some more time warping. Uh, again, keeping an eye on Muna 1 and making sure it doesn't get itself into any trouble. And trouble it got itself into. Now, one thing to notice here is that although I do have communication links, I actually don't have a connection. And that's because the antenna on this probe is actually pointed very specifically at mission control. It's not set to that pointing to Kerbin and towards the cone. And I ended up getting this moon encounter with absolutely no connection uh, so there's not much i can do and again it could be worse i could be crashing into the moon with nothing it can do periapsis is really high so i doubt i would have had enough fuel to actually affect my trajectory and hit the moon anyway in fact i, I know for a fact that i don't so uh this is just as well but there's nothing left to do but to just time warp and hope for the best hope this moon encounter doesn't mess up my orbit and get it stopping to intersect the moon. Anyway, I got my connection back, so I'm gonna take advantage of that and take this antenna and now point it at Kerbin rather than pointing it at mission control so that now it'll be that cone of communication and it will be able to communicate with ComSat 1 or ComSat 2 if either of those two happen to be in a position to be able to relay a signal out here. So my communication will become a lot more stable out here towards the moon. And then it's just a question of time warping uh, getting out of the moon's sphere of influence, checking it out. Yeah, my orbit has gotten bigger, but it's still in orbit, and it's still intersecting the moon's orbit. So, uh, yeah, 
I should, you know, <laughs> this thing is still alive. This mission is still doable. Remember, the mission is to actually test the ant engine, which is on this thing, on a suborbital trajectory to the moon. So hopefully, uh, one day in the future, I will be in a position to finish this mission off. But for now, I'll just time warp to the completion of the upgrade on the vehicle assembly building. And I was very, very excited about this because this finally lifts that 30 part restriction that I've had on my vessels. And right off the bat, I, I got myself a little bit ambitious and started to get into the designing and testing of Propolo 1, which was going to be a moon flyby mission. And I was able to pimp this thing out. I was able to put on all these groovy lights you know, and, and, and deck this thing out with science, and you know, it was it was great, and it worked pretty well, and I got it up into orbit, and I could see I had plenty of fuel left over in order to do a moon flyby, but uh, then better sense kind of prevailed, uh, and this had to do with contracts. I have to start finishing off some contracts, um, and I do have these two remote tech contracts, which will not get finished off until I have my communication network complete. So I thought, you know what? I'm better off uh, just pushing, redesigning. I did redesign the ComSats and pushed out a ComSat 3 and ComSat 4. Get those things out there so I can finish off this communication network, bang off these contracts. Then I'll start thinking a little bit more about the moon. And that brings us to the final mission of this particular episode, Valentina and Company in the Curse Stock 4. And I want to show you this, this new part that's on this thing. This orange, little orange part here, is from a mod called Smart Parts. And what it is doing is it is monitoring the fuel in that booster. And when that fuel runs out, it automatically stages for me. So that wasn't me doing the staging. That was actually the smart part doing the staging. We'll spin around as I switch views. I'm, I'm starting to fall in love with this, this new chase camera. I really, really kind of like it. But anyway, uh, you can see that I am using um, uh, KOS for my ascent. Uh, so I could have written into the script to do, this, to do the staging. But uh, then I have to modify the script all the time depending upon the design of my particular rocket. And what I really like about this is um, that I can attach the smart parts to individual rockets. And of course, they stay with that particular vessel. And so I can use the smart parts to customize the staging as I do my ascent. And then the KOS script just stays the same for, for all of my ascents. Anyway, the mission here is simply to get these two tourists into orbit. This is part of the mega mission uh, that, that has all kinds of touristy things going on. So a, a pretty routine mission, even though this is actually only my second, uh, third and fourth, I guess, Kerbinauts to get into orbit. And I thought I'd play around a little bit more with Raster Prop Monitor. Um, you know, now that this thing's ascending automatically and I don't have to do anything, it gives me the luxury of playing around while we ascend. So I like this, this orbital uh, data that gives you lots of information including a graphic on your orbit. We'll put the, that one camera on the map Ooh, Getting some heating effects out the window. That's exciting uh, I'm getting really really kind of th th these heating effects are out of control. I think from squad But anyway, let's see. Well, what are we gonna put on this one? Play around here. We got this uh, altitude graph nah. Oh, targets that doesn't matter that doesn't matter that doesn't matter oh the, that's a docking port indicator or docking indicator oh we'll put it on resources that's pretty good wow look at that lots of heating effects what's happening with the map the map's still rendering but i don't know maybe i should go outside and check whoa <laughs> this is ridiculous this heating and i know it looks like i'm about to blow up my rocket but nothing's overheating it's perfectly fine uh, squad's just gone ballistic with the heating effects. So don't worry about this kind of stuff. It looks ridiculous, and it looks like I'm doing something wrong, but I am not. And I really, really hope there's an update. I know it's just cosmetic, and I do know that, but I mean, it, it's a little silly. It's a little over the top. Anyway, you can see our map here. It's showing our trajectory. That's pretty cool. Lots of nice stuff. You can, you know, one of these days I will do a complete... Uh, I'll do at least sections of missions completely from the internal view, but there's lots of stuff you can do here. Oh, it's all black out the windows. Oh, 
I've just passed 50 kilometers. So oh, programs ended, KOS programs now done. So we'll close that. So now I have got control again, manual control. So why don't we spin this around? Oh, there's Kerbin. Yes, nice view of Kerbin. So we'll just cut on up to Apoapsis and our circularization. Oh, what's that? What's that back there? It's about 100 kilometers away. Something's behind us. What do we got? Oh, oh, it's Ribfell. Oh, Ribfell stuck in orbit. That's one of our, uh, that's one of our uh, rescue of Kerbal missions. Oh, I feel bad. He's so close. I could actually have picked him up if I had any uh, cabin space in that thing, which I don't. Sorry, Ribfell. We're going to have to uh, leave you behind, but we will come and get you someday, we promise. <laughs> anyway, we'll complete this burn. One of the things I'm going to be doing, by the way, from now on is keeping the uh, escape tower, the abort tower at the top, keeping that on, at least for these low orbit missions. And the reason is, is because uh, I'm using it as a redundant engine. I am playing with dang it and dang it. One of the possibilities is having parts failing, including engines. So I don't want to leave people in orbit um, on just a single engine. Uh, I got to start thinking a little bit about redundancy, either redundancy or having somebody on board who can fix it. There's nobody on board this vessel who could fix the engine if it failed. So what I have instead is I'm going to keep the escape tower on there. And the escape tower, if I activate it while pointing retrograde, of course, it has more than enough delta V in it to uh, deorbit this vessel. So I'm going to keep it as a redundant engine and not get rid of it. And there we go. We now have ourselves in orbit with 317 meters per second still to spare. More than enough <laughs> to get these guys back down. In fact, way more than I anticipated because when I sent this vessel actually was packed with uh, 3,776 meters per second of vacuum delta V. That's how much it had. Um, at launch and if you subtract off the 317 meters per second it has now that meant that ascent only cost me 3459 meters per second which feels really really low but it's starting to make my really cheap ascent I had with that concept too at the beginning of this video make a little bit more sense squad with that last update you've been playing with the aerodynamics haven't you <laughs> things seem to be a little cheaper so Oh, I'll have to have to look into that, but it does. I, I'm starting to feel that uh, ascents now aren't going to be quite as costly as they have been in in the past. Might have to start budgeting less for them. Anyway, it's time to get these folks back down to the surface. Our mission is now completed. It was just simply to get in orbit, so we've done that. So. We'll burn, turn ourselves retrograde, of course, burn, get our periapsis down to around 30 kilometers or so. Hopefully we'll end up landing somewhere near the Kerbal Space Center. And now that it is gravity that will be the sole propulsion of this particular vessel, we do not need that redundant energy or engine that is in the escape tower. In fact, we don't need any engine at all. So we will uh, jettison the service module. We will jettison the escape tower and we will just descend and the descent went without any issues and in fact i don't know just to change things up a little bit i thought i'd watch the whole descent from uh, inside the cockpit i do have to be a little careful um i'll put this thing on let's see uh this big nav ball that works well because i do have to uh keep it on the retrograde vector manually uh this thing doesn't want to stay naturally on it and i'll put the other monitor there on an altitude graph. We can sit there and watch the ground go by. You can also look at my trajectory. That's a lot of fun. This is a little bit nerve-wracking to be honest. Um, I, I really have a compulsion to go outside and sort of, or you know, look at the outside view and sort of see what how things are going now that I'm seeing the heating effects. But as long as I keep it on that retrograde vector, I should be perfectly fine. My trajectory looks like it's going to be a smidge short. Yeah, definitely. Uh, hopefully I won't end up in the mountains. That would be really, 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 really bad. Well, it's looking now like I'm definitely going to be falling to the west of the mountains. My velocity is slowing down considerably. 
to the point where I can deploy the parachutes. There we go, they are now partially deployed. Yeah, according to Kerbal Engineer, I'm landing in the highlands. But, I don't know, it doesn't look too hilly below me. Falling down, falling down, watching my altimeter there. So that rate, oh, 500, oh, there goes my parachutes for real. They're fully deployed now, I'm 200 meters from the surface, looking pretty flat. Let's see if we can get a nice view. No, nothing but sky out that window. Oh, look at my shadow there. Oh, that's pretty nice. Looking pretty flat below me. I think I'm going to be all right. Watching that radar altimeter. What's that, about 80 meters? Coming down. I should be able to tell when I touch just from the shadow here. And boom, touchdown. Excellent. So we are down safely. And that's going to have to end this particular mission. And not just this mission, but also this particular episode. Thank you for watching. And I hope to see you next time.